Have you ever thought about starting your own brand of whiskey? Well, I actually did it. So if you wanna hear about how, stick around. So I started my own brand, The Prideful Goat. What's the origin story of The Prideful Goat? Well, I went to a Texas Whiskey Association event at Gulf Coast Distillers. I'm walking around with the owner. He lets me try his 15 year Kentucky straight bourbon. And after trying it, I said, hey, can I get a single barrel of this? And he was like, yeah, no problem. I said, how many can I get? He said, as many as you want. So I set up four separate clubs to get single barrels of this 15 year Kentucky straight bourbon. But the distillery manager called me and said, hey, we got a problem. This stuff is in totes. It's not in barrels. So if you pick one, which you still can do, it's gonna be 1200 bottles. So I called my good friend Christopher Hart, who runs Houston Bourbon Society. And he said, you know what's cooler than doing a single barrel with a tater sticker? Creating your own label. So I reached out to the owner of the distillery and he said, have a ball. We got to name our own whiskey. But then the question is, what do you name it? We only had one rule when we got started, and that was we wanted the label to look like an old world Irish pub. So I start looking for Gaelic words. And I actually came up with a word combination but after sharing it with Christopher, he was like, hey, when people translate these Gaelic words and realize that we named this whiskey after our last names, they're not gonna think that was very cool. So Christopher hits me with, well, what about the prideful goat? And my response was, have you been playing around on a hipster word generator? Cause I'd used one not too long before that. And that's the kind of word combination it kicks out. And he's like, no man, no, honestly, I just thought of it on my own. And I was like, yeah, sure you did. Uh, we still kind of debate that to this day, but to Chris's credit, he's the one that came up with the name. So Christopher reached out and he actually had a designer that he knows design the goat separate. And then after we got the goat right, and if you look at him, he looks prideful. You can see it in his eyes. We sent it over to our actual label designer who started to work on it all. We had to clear everything through legal and make sure the name was available. But after we got that taken care of, our label was created and we were off to the races. So what have I learned about being a non-distiller producer? Well, first off, there's three different sources of liquid when you're starting your own distillery. The first source is what we are, what we call a non-distiller producer, where we go out and we buy other people's whiskey that they made years ago. It's pretty much ready to go into a bottle or it's part of the way through the aging process and you're gonna bottle it the way that you wanna bottle it later. But in any case, you didn't design the mash bill. It's not really your whiskey. You're not making it yourself. The second way is to contract distill. And that is where you go to a distillery that has capacity, which is hard to find these days because so many distilleries are producing as much whiskey as they can for their own labels. And you get to design your own mash bill, maybe even pick your own yeast strain. And the only problem with that is that you have to wait for it to age. And so when you're trying to start a new brand, it's very difficult to predict how many bottles you're going to sell your first year, your second year, your third year. And it costs a lot of money to go ahead and produce those bottles and have them sitting in a barrel waiting for the time that you can actually start to monetize your investment. And if you're like us, we really would love to always release products that are at least six years old. So that means you'd have to guess for six years how much you needed. And if you turned out to be wrong, it could be a financial catastrophe. And you also have to wait for six years, invest for six years before you could ever expect to make a penny. So that doesn't really work for everybody, but I definitely respect new brands that go down that path. The third way is to start a full distillery. You've got to buy all of the distillery equipment. Unless you're going to send your juice off to be bottled someplace else, you're going to have to have your own bottling line. And that is the most expensive way to do it. And the way that a lot of craft producers start off, and that's also very respectable. They face the same problems that a contract distiller faces, plus all of the additional financial burden of having to buy all of that distillery equipment and get their facility set up and everything. And they're doing it for years before they can hope to monetize. Oh, well, hello there, you fellow bourbon lovers, you. 
I don't know why I'm talking like that. Anyways, I want to invite you over to the bourbonrealtalk.com store today. After the show, go check it out. We've got new merch that's just hit the shop. We've got travel cases for your uh, wee glens and your big glens. We've got toppers for your glens as well. We've got the rocks glasses that we offer now and all the other cool merch that you're used to seeing there. So go check it out after the show and support the channel by checking out our store and picking up a couple things and getting them on your doorstep a few days later. We can't wait for you to check out all the new merch that we've got to offer now at bourbonrealtalk.com. The next thing that I learned is labels are extremely complicated. The number one label printer for spirits in the United States happens to be about 25 minutes from my house. And that's who we use to print the labels for the Prideful Goat. And if you ever pick up a bottle and you feel that there's some texture to the label, that's because things like this get printed in layers. And so they do a thing called a press check. So when we were printing this label, I'm not a very experienced person when it comes to this, right? I, I, you go in and you're looking at, you know, it, the first layer, you have to check to make sure that all the gradient is the way that you like it and the coloring is the way that you like it. And then after you approve that, they'll print the full production run and then they put the next le layer on. And I think this, this particular label goes through three different runs. Um, all the background information, then um, the letters with the gold foil, then the, the race part, the clear part that goes on top that gives it a little bit of texture. And I gotta tell you, I was scared to death because I knew that as soon as I said, yes, this is okay, they were gonna run off tens of thousands of dollars worth of labels. If I approved something that was wrong, all that money would have gone to waste and obviously the distillery wouldn't have been very happy with me. So that was kind of a puckering experience for me to be sitting there and to approve the production run of something that was so costly with so little experience. But all that hard work ended up paying off because the Prideful Goat had the print company submit this label in a print competition and it won actually the number one label in the world for the alcohol category, which is the most competitive category. And so we're very proud of that fact. Uh, Christopher and the design team did a great job with this label. The print company did a great job. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty satisfying to know that we we're in competition with all of the big boys out of Kentucky and we still came in on top. Another very interesting thing that I learned after starting the brand is single barrels. So a lot of times when you go to do a single barrel, people will say, is this a reject barrel? Meaning has somebody else tasted this barrel and decided not to pick it? And I used to feel that way too until I started my own brand. Because whenever you buy barrels or your barrels are mature and they're ready to be sold or, or you know batched, you have to go through and you have to taste them all. And you have to figure out which ones are special, which ones are common, and that's how you decide what's gonna go into your batches and what you feel like might be unique enough or special enough that you wanna pull it out and have that available as a single barrel so that people can experience that expression. And that's exactly what we did. I went down to Houston. We had barrel samples lined up for us. We had to taste them all. Uh, unfortunately, when you're doing that, you do have to spit out the whiskey. You'd probably die trying to try all of those cash strength barrels and figure out which ones you're gonna put into your barrel program. But after going through that process, I realized there's really no such thing as a reject barrel. The reject barrels, if you will, uh, not because they taste bad, but because there's nothing you know, particularly unique about them, go into the batches. Every ba barrel that gets put into the single barrel program has some unique characteristic to it so that it doesn't really matter what you pick, you should be getting something that's pretty delicious. Another thing that I learned is that distribution is crucial for growing a brand. Now, this is something that as a consumer, I didn't know very much about, but there's three different types of states. There's open states like Texas, there's franchise states, and then there's control states. In control states, basically all of the liquor stores are controlled by the state government. In franchise states, those are states where once you've picked a wholesaler, you're married for life. It's very difficult to get out of the contract. And it can be very difficult uh, because when you're a new brand, it's hard to get a, a wholesaler to really give you the attention that your brand needs for it to grow. And so until you're kind of somebody, 
you don't want to get fully married to a wholesaler because after you you sign that contract if they don't go out and pound the pavement and help you grow your brand you're not going to be able to hire somebody else that's going to help you get the job done another really interesting thing that i learned is the difference between three and four tier states so in the united states liquor can typically not be sold from a producer directly to the consumer it has to go through a wholesaler and then from the wholesaler to a retail store and then from the retail store it can be sold to a consumer there are some exceptions because every state has their own laws but generally that's how it works in a four tier state a bar or a restaurant cannot purchase from the wholesaler. They have to purchase from the liquor store. And the liquor stores in Texas have a separate license called a Class B. And once they have that license, they're allowed to sell almost like a wholesaler would directly to bars and restaurants. As a producer, people often ask me, Randy, where can I find your whiskey? And the truth is, I don't always know. Sometimes the wholesalers have a portal that I can go into and they can tell me all of the different stores that they've been able to sell product to and those stores may or may not currently have it on hand, but I at least know that at one point they were carrying the product. But in a four tier state, I have no visibility whatsoever as to what bars and restaurants have my product. Another interesting thing that I've learned is the difference between big retailers and independent stores. So. We are lucky enough that Christopher has relationships at very high levels at some of the largest retail stores. So Total Wine has been a big supporter of the Prideful Goat all across the country. But when you're growing a, a brand, you don't necessarily just wanna go into one giant retailer. You wanna be picked up by all the small independent stores and hopefully your product moves so that they will start to reorder, right? And so it's this weird situation where you can grow your brand quickly if you can get the right relationship with the large retailer, but often you are exchanging that easy process for uh, maybe margin or the ability to, to sell the product in the general market. Sometimes the large retail stores will guarantee you your sales, but then they wanna make your product kind of a house brand. And usually when they do that, they have higher margins on that stuff. So that's why sometimes when you go into large retailers, they have particular brands that they always seem to be pushing over others. Those are their house brands, if you will, that they have the higher margin on. So for us, we wanna use a combination of the strategy of yes, we're gonna do business with large retail stores, but not in an exclusive way. And we're also going to go out and foster those relationships with the mom and pop shops that are out there because you put a, a large network of those independent stores together and you're able to actually cover a lot of ground and reach a lot of new customers. So one of the most interesting things about all of this is that a producer like myself could have the best product in the world and still fail because you do have to have those business relationships and you have to have a system for getting the product to the places where you can find consumers and grow that brand. And so it's not always the best product that wins. Sometimes it's the product with the larger financial backing and sometimes it's the product that just had a better marketing plan. So what do I want you to know about the Prideful Goat? Well, the first thing was, it's better to be lucky than good. I was lucky. I could not have made this opportunity happen. I happened to be at the right place at the right time, met the right people, and I was willing to step out on a limb and take the chance, and here we are today. The second thing is the Prideful Goat is meant to be a cash strength, non-chill filtered product because we're trying to target whiskey enthusiasts like you. We figure if you want the whiskey at a lower proof, you're more than capable of doing that at the house. We don't have to put water in it for you before we bottle it. So not only are we targeting the whiskey enthusiast community, but we are aiming to be the best value of our time. Because we're non-distiller producers and we are buying finished barrels from other people, not like finished whiskey, but barrels that are finished aging, we're not the only brand that's releasing this whiskey. But most of the other brands are proofing down, they are chill filtering, and we know that somebody else could produce the same whiskey, non-chill filtered and cash strength, but we don't think they're gonna be able to release it at a price unless it's higher than ours. Another thing I'd like you to focus on is that Bourbon Real Talk has never asked you for money. Uh, we don't have a Patreon, and so far we haven't had any show sponsors. So my general philosophy is, if the attention that my podcast is getting is worth money to somebody else who wants to sell you something, 
it makes more sense for me to just start a business that does that. And so rather than have an alcohol brand sponsor the podcast, I got to create my own. Rather than have a company that makes whiskey related things and sell them to you through my channel, I just started a company that sources stuff and I sell you my own stuff. So if you want to support Bourbon Real Talk, you can pick up a bottle of the Prideful Goat or you can go to the shop and pick up some things there that you're probably already going to buy. And just like the whiskey, I hope that my products are always a relative value compared to your other options. So I thank you for tuning in. I hope that you will go join Bourbon Real Talk community. That is a Facebook-based group. There is where I release information about virtual tastings and things like that. If you want to get your hands on some Prideful Goat, right now we have distribution in California, Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Florida. If you're not in one of those states, we just ship product to bourbonoutfitters.com. So you can go to bourbonoutfitters.com, check it out, see if they ship to your area. You can buy a bottle, have it shipped directly to your door. If you want to know what retail locations have the product, you can go to the video description and click the link with the map. And on that map, it will show you all of the retail stores that have ever bought this product. Of course, we don't know whether or not it's currently in inventory. You should call ahead, but that would be an easy place to find it. And I've had some people that have gone on vacation to Florida. They looked around. There's still a little bit of 15 year prideful goat in Florida, Louisiana and California as of the date of this filming. So if this is your first time tuning into this podcast, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our show philosophy. Um, this podcast is about bringing people together around bourbon to increase connection. And the reason why that's important to me is because I lost a loved one to suicide in 2014. And after my brother took his life, I realized that there's a lot of people out there that feel alone and unconnected. And the whiskey community has a tendency to bring people together, even people that have different ideological views that maybe wouldn't have gotten into a friendship otherwise. And that is part of the reason why I started this podcast. And it's also part of the reason why we started Bourbon Real Talk Community, where we could have a space of like-minded whiskey enthusiasts getting together in a discussion forum without the troll-like behavior. Um, that was important for me to get started because as I started to grow in the enthusiast community, I saw a lot of troll-like hateful behavior on some of these forums. And it was discouraging to me, but it did make me realize that if this person can be hateful to you, even though they don't really know you, there's nothing that keeps me from loving you, even though I don't really know you. And that's why I end every podcast the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. A whiskey troll is a person who seeks negative attention and uses contrarian attitudes to derail civil discussion in online forums. They communicate in ways they never would face to face because they're keyboard warriors. Their only goal is to make other people feel inferior. Hey guys, I'm new here. I just got my first blatant. And trust me, you probably paid way too much. I don't care much about the blends, but nice <laughs> There's no way that she didn't buy that at secondary, idiot. Oh, I know how you got that bottle. So, are you sick and tired of the whiskey trolls running your fun online? Well, that's why we started Bourbon Real Talk Community. Congratulations. Let me know what you think when you open it up. Hey, welcome to the group. Let me send you over a sample of Blanton's Gold and straight from the barrel. See how you like those. I remember back to my first bottle of Blanton's. It was the birthday to my son, and we enjoy it every year on his birthday. Congrats. So if you're looking to connect with some people online who aren't head over to facebook.com and join Bourbon Real Talk community today.